Father God, thank you for Stu. Thank you for the amazing man and example he is, Lord. I pray that as he speaks to us, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive and that you would fill him with your spirit to speak to us this evening. In your name I pray. Amen. Great. Thanks, Dan. Well, evening, GP lifers. I've, I've been coming to this series to get an idea of what it's like, and I've been completely amazed and blown away with just the presence of God here, the energy, the enthusiasm, the seeking of God in your lives. So I've certainly come to listen and to learn, and I've been blown away. So I just love seeing what God's doing amongst us, and well done to all of you for what you're doing. So I'm just going to talk for about 15 minutes quickly. I've got a couple of slides to take you through, because I think what's really been great about this series is let's talk about it, and time to be able to get together and in groups. So we're going to do that again this evening. We're going to break up into groups of four or five. We're going to chat for a couple of minutes. We're going to come up with some questions that you were really burning after we've done the slides together, and then I've got some great panelists that are going to join me, and then we can ask some really good questions. So as, as has been the best thing about this series is this is a time to be vulnerable and open and honest with each other, so there's no, there's no secrets here. So if we can just crack on with the, f- the five slides that I've got. The first one is I just want to define what work is. The second one I want to design, define what integrity is. Then I've got a game changer scripture that changed my life, and then we're going to look at the definition of character, and then finally, the bigger picture. Have you got the slide show for us, Sam? Cool. So let's start with the definition of work. Now, when I use the word work, I'm talking about whatever you are working in at the moment. It's not work as in like per se me going to work. It could be you at school. It could be whatever you are spending your time doing at the moment. So just keep that in mind. So if we go right to the beginning in Genesis chapter 2. So this is when Adam was in the Garden of Eden. In fact, Eve wasn't even with him at this stage in Genesis chapter 2. And it says that the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work at it and take care of it. So I don't know about you, but my perception of the Garden of Eden is this paradise, this beautiful place that Adam and Eve just cruised around and they could do whatever they liked. But actually, it was a place of work. And God's first calling on Adam was to actually work the garden, as in like it needed to be tended, it needed to be cared for, there was pruning to be done, there was cleaning to do, there was a whole lot of graft that had to be done. It wasn't just parking off. So God designed work for us even from before the fall. It goes on to say in verse 19, Now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was their name. So not only was Adam called to work, God actually gave him responsibility. Can you imagine that simple task, that simple task of starting all the names of the animals and the birds? It was a massive task. So God is about responsibility, he's about accountability, he's about hard work, and and he's about results. So if you came here thinking that work is a four-letter word, which is often how the world sees it, the world says, ah, work is a curse. Work is not a curse because God actually created it right in the beginning. Even after the fall, work was there, but God just said work would get a little bit harder. So I don't want you to see your work as a curse, but rather as a calling. It's an opportunity. Adam was called to work the garden. That's what God asked him to do. So wherever you're at now, I want you just to reflect on that and think, okay, so what is my Eden? Where has God placed me today, and what is my calling to do that? So I hope that's helped define work. And if we look at now how to work, So, I'm fortunate that if we can go to the next slide, please, Sam. The business that I work in, Halsteads, we have uh, a bunch of values that we decided that we work towards, and we, as leadership of the business, came up with the values, and we have one of our values as integrity, and it means beyond reproach, which is quite a strong description. It's no mess, no fuss. It means that in everything we do, in every transaction and interaction with our staff and with our customers, we want to be beyond reproach, which means it's a consistent and uncompromising, strong adherence to moral and ethical values. Sounds brilliant, doesn't it? And it needs consistency and authenticity. And yes, it is authentic. It's in our value system. We say to our 890 people that work here, guys, we're about being beyond reproach. And it's a great thing, and we work hard at it, and everybody has it in their, in their system. But where is true north? That's the big question, is that we can all share a value system. But what my value system and your value system, they might sign the same, but who gets to call the shots? Who gets to decide 
where does the value really go? What is really beyond reproach? What is actually, is it mean that I only can steal once or twice? Or maybe it's only, should I try and get away with the odd thing, and as long as nobody sees, I'm okay? It's the same with integrity in relationships, isn't it? It's like, well, it's okay if I just don't get caught. You see, that's the problem with integrity, is it's, it can be a man-made resource. It's determined by what I feel and what you feel. And therefore, you can work hard at it and you can try as hard as you like, but where does it end and where does it start? Because I've found that there are many people in this world that love to live a life of integrity and do not have a knowledge of Christ. Even non-Christians are good oaks and they try and live their life that is beyond reproach. So that's brought me to what I call the game changer. This is the next slide, next slide, please, Sam. Sure, there's a lot of S's in there. This scripture changed my life. It was about 2000. I remember I was driving to work, and I think it had been shared at church that Sunday, and I'd read it there, and I really got hit, almost collided with, while I was driving my car. And it was, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you, and to carry favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. This changed my life 180 degrees because I work for a really good family. They're a great bunch of people, but it really hit me that I don't work for the Halsteads. I work for the king of this universe. I work for God himself. Now that changes the game, doesn't it? That's not about working so that I can carry favor with my boss. That's not working about, geez, I must make sure that I'm beyond reproach so that no one can question me. But it rather now says, sure, with sincerity of heart in everything that I do, I'm working as if I'm working unto God himself. Doesn't that lift it up another notch, doesn't it? It's a, it doesn't matter about who your headmaster is, who your teacher is, who your boss is, who, who you answer to. You actually answer to God himself. He is your boss. And he's given you talents. And he's given you giftings. Each uniquely designed just for you to do in your Eden. And it says in the Bible that we are called to worship him with our time and with our talents and our giftings. So now that changes the whole thing. Because I'm going to really work hard at what God has given me to do well. At trying to glorify him in all I do. And then that means that integrity beyond reproach now takes a completely do a new level, doesn't it? It's not just about trying to please Mr. Halstead. It's about trying to please God himself. So job satisfaction goes to the roof, even if you've got a really crummy boss. <laughs> it's okay because God's given you that place and that moment in order to, to infect and affect those that are around you. So I started to see worship. I started to see my work as worship. I started to be grateful for the talents that God had given me. I started to want to fan those talents into flame because the more that I could be in His will and in His purpose in my life, then it meant that the more that those would glorify God in all that I do. So without a solid base of Christ, then I definitely would have fallen many more times than I did. And I'm not saying that I didn't fall. There are definitely times where I'm thinking, what was I thinking? How could I do that? But when you've got Christ as your true north star, and when you've got the word of God as your basis, then you're always going to come back to that beyond reproach, because you're asking yourself every time, every transaction, everything that I do, am I doing this to glorify God? Would God be chuffed with what I'm doing? There's so many examples in my experience at work. There are, everybody out there is trying to trip you up, not for you but for their own gain. It's, please, under invoice, over invoice, are you sure we need to charge a VAT on that? What about not the duty? Are you sure we can't get around the duty? Those are just obvious ones. Bribing. How about the customs duty? What about this? What about that? What about, you know, there's just everywhere, and it is there like a cancer. If you just start to take one little bite at it before you know it, you're overrun by it. And it only brings you down and the other person wins. There's no one U.S. dollar that is worth trading your life for. There's no one U.S. dollar that's worth questioning your integrity. It is best to walk away and ask God what He would rather have you do with yourself. So if we just go to the next slide, retaining a God-centered worldview so that God 
so that the world can view God himself. We're in the world and of this world. But if we, if we can maintain a God-centered worldview, i.e., you, God, you tell me what I'm supposed to do in this world, then there's a much better chance that the world is going to see God through you. And that gets a little bit harder now because we're talking about actually character. Because you can have the best integrity and you can have the best front foot forward at work or at play, but what about Stuart Knight, the father? What about Stuart, the husband? What about Stuart, the brother? What about Stuart, the elder at church? What about the Stuart, the guy at work? Do all of those characters add up? If we're to look across all of those activities in my life, is there a common thread? And that's where you've just got to take time with God. In those quiet times in the morning, asking Him just to reveal in your character where there's blemishes, where there's flaws. And if you're like me, <laughs> it takes a long time to find those blemishes and flaws. You've got to take the time to just let God examine you because He's gentle and He's kind and He loves you beyond your wildest dreams. He's going to help you to develop that character that is consistent throughout because your life is like a billboard, unfortunately. Everybody's watching. Everybody would love to be able to say, ah, oh, this guy looks counterfeit. Yes, he talks about faith in the workplace, but I've seen this about him. I've heard this about him because they love to discount you. Because if they can discount you, then they don't have to actually look at what makes you tick. And then they can say, okay, well, look, he's just like us. So I'm all right. I can be like him. My day starts early in the morning. And I, my family knows that if I walk down the passage, I can turn right in the morning to go to my Bible. Or I can left, turn left and go to my laptop. I can assure you that there's much more supernatural results in my life if I turn right every morning. Because that's where... My day starts and finishes, really, because it's in that time that you're going to God and saying, I want to be vulnerable with you, God. Tell me where integrity starts and finishes. Where am I supposed to talk? What am I supposed to do today? Who am I supposed to infect? Who am I supposed to help? Who am I supposed to talk to? Which is fantastic for you being able to influence and affect people that you're around. But there's an even bigger picture, and that's the final slide that I wanted to look at. In Psalm, what Psalm is it, 11, David asked a very important question. And he says, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I don't know about you, but if you look around this world, the foundations are under extreme pressure. Every foundation of what we would know, love, joy, peace, justice, every foundation of this world is under question. Do we agree? So, so David was asking the question, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And that's you and me, what can we do? And I'd encourage you to go and read the rest of the psalm. I couldn't fit it on the slide because I'm technically challenged. But if you look from verses 4 to 7, but I'll give you the answers. It says, the Lord is present. He is in his holy temple. That's you and me. The Lord is on his throne. He is king over your life and my life. The Lord is watching over you. He is with you at all times. The Lord loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. So I'm calling this the bigger picture because it's great to get your character right. It's great to have integrity in the workplace. But there's a higher calling to this. It's because it doesn't matter where you are or what Eden you're in, you are going to infect or affect those that are around you. And that is the community that you live in. And you need to ask yourself that question, what am I doing to uphold the foundations of this community that we live in? And what am I doing to hold those foundations up? So it's a bigger picture, isn't it? It's about the community that we live in. It's about glorifying God in all that we do. So it comes back, there's no getting away from it. It comes back to your personal relationship with Christ. It comes back to those times when you're with Him and asking Him, what should I do? And having God in you means that you're submitting to Him as, you, as the author and protect, perfecter of your faith. It means that you are being there and asking Him for His calling on your life because after all, He made you for a unique purpose. And always remember that God is never not with you. He's just there all the time. And then we are there to ask Him to guide and to govern our lives. That's the simple relationship He asks for. And never give up. 
never give up on yourselves, never give up on praying. And there's a time, there's definitely a time in your lives where you have to let go and let God. That's kind of the ultimate, isn't it? It's like where I've trusted you with everything. I really want you to allow me to infect and affect those around me. But sometimes you've got to let God be God. And you have to let yourself go. And that's quite hard, isn't it? That's the ultimate in submission. So that's my lot. I'm hoping that was short and sharp and it's got your brains thinking. I'd love to call up Leon Rademeyer, who you will all know. Leon and uh, Lloyd, would you want to just come up and join me? Can we give them a hand?